then uh, we will uh, start now with the first uh, session. Um, if I don't remember, but uh, is uh, the first uh, one to make a presentation is Bert Offren from IBM uh, Zurich uh, Research. And the title for these presentations is Neuromorphic Devices, State of the Art and Future Trends. Then, uh, Bert, please. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Thank you very much for the organizers for inviting me. It's my great pleasure to uh, give a presentation here on neuromorphic devices. And maybe you wonder what it is, neuromorphic devices, and why is it of interest to work on that? Um, I will go through that, give an introduction, and I will also talk about, say, both electrical means to do neuromorphic devices, and of course, this is for Transix Integration Week, also optical means, and I will discuss a little bit what are the differences, why is optics of interest, why is electrical implementation of interest, and where will this go in the end? I don't know yet, but we will see. So, if you look at silicon technology, um, silicon CMOS, there are three pillars. We have, of course, all the materials um, that have become more and more in order to be able to sustain the roadmap, which is here, the um, um, say the scaling, that's what I mean with roadmap, going to smaller and smaller transistors. And of course, very important, the whole packaging roadmap in order to be able to integrate all these silicon components um, on package, uh, printed trucker boards and so on. Um, we currently are, I would say, in very exciting times because it's clear that scaling is over, at least clearly still some scaling is happening, but it's getting more and more expensive. Um, and what we also see is that the technology as it is available is capable of already addressing such a tremendous amount of um, functions um, that say the ability to scale is only there um, for um, a limited amount of applications. Um, on top of that, there is a new kind of problem emerging. Um, if you look at a company like IBM that I'm from, uh, I'm from IBM Research in Zurich, um, IBM really became big with, um, say, building systems for doing um, accounting, bookkeeping, IT. Um, which means, in fact, that you know exactly what kind of problem you have. You have numbers, you put them together, um, all very well defined. If you now look at, for example, this picture on the right-hand side, um, determine what is there, what, uh, um, what kind of information do we see there. For us humans, that's something that's pretty straightforward, and we do that with our brain, which takes 20 watts. If you would like to do this with a computer, um, you're not sure what the outcome will be, and for sure, you need a lot of power in order to get an outcome at all. Um, which means that, say, the kind of computing systems as we have them today are not ideally suited to solve this kind of problem. Um, so, looking at, say, these two changes, and for example, look at a company like IBM, but of course, all these kind of blue chip companies, um, say, the whole transition of computing, um, going from, say, selling computing systems, servers, software, and so on, the transition to the cloud, uh, which is, of course, also based on this whole 
um, um, paradigm that I was just talking about, it then forces us to look into, say, new, um, new computing paradigms in order to address the next step. And that is, for example, quantum computing, but also neuromorphic computing. And neuromorphic computing is ideally suited also to address the kind of problem that I just uh, spoke about here. So neuromorphic computing. Neuro means related to, say, the nerves, the nervous system. Um, morphic means having a structure of, so having a structure of nerves, of neurons. Um, so neuromorphic computing is often, um, say, related to as brain-inspired computing, which means, okay, do computing in some way as we believe how the brain is working. Of course, the challenge is that we don't know in detail how the brain is working, um, but okay, still we know a little bit and we can try to build systems that are related to this. So that's what I want to talk about this, um, in this presentation. Uh, talk about neuromorphic computing and the kind of structure that we address and then go into new ways to do the processing for neural networks using analog computing and address two kinds of systems, an electrical system as well as a photonic system. And I will compare them a little bit just in the discussion um, to give you a feeling, well, where could this go? Um, and then I will conclude. So if we look at, um, say, a brain um, and um, the way how it's built up, what you see there are these, these blue dots that are neurons. Um, which is, say, a nonlinear function. It, the neuron generates a signal if the input signal is large enough. Um, and then all these neurons are interconnected with these lines. And on these lines, you see these little yellow dots that are the weights of these lines, or so the strength of these connections. And all these blue dots, they are all the same. So they're all, say, so to say, simple computing systems, the neurons. Um, and in the end, the function of this system really determines by the interconnections and by, say, which connections are there and how strong they are. So if we want to, say, classify the picture that's coming in on the left, um, in the end, where the output we get determines on all the connect determines, uh, is determined by all the connections that we have. Now, in, um, say, in a, for example, the human brain, what we have is that signals are encoded uh, by pulses. We have signals going, say, in several directions, so omnidirectional flow. Um, and um, also a lot of the information is, in the end, encoded in the timing of all these pulses. Now, to really find out the right architecture for such a network is a very complex task, to find the right values for all these yellow dots. So. Um, if you look at today's neural networking systems that are really, say, successful and used, um, that are a, a strong simplification of the way how we are looking at, say, the, the human brain. Um, and that kind of system is called um, a deep artificial neural network. So an artificial neural network because it, it just resembles far away um, to the way how we believe that the brain is working. <clears throat> and what you see there on the right-hand uh, right side is that we have, again, the same interconnections and the same yellow, uh, sorry, the same blue dots. Um, however, in, in the artificial neural network, signals are going strictly from left to right, um, so they are feed forward. Um, information is now not encoded in pulses, but in uh, just a signal amplitude that's given at the input. The amplitude is transporting from, transported from left to right uh, through the system, and that's it. And then as soon as you come with a new signal, you start all over again. Um, and Okay, again, we have this neural activation, which is a nonlinear function, so um, nonlinear function of the input um, and um, a kind of thresholding function. Well, wh why, why is this um, neural network of so much interest? Um, the reason is that there is a mathematical algorithm to find the right values for these yellow dots, for these interconnections. Um, and that, um, mathematical algorithm is called the um, back, back propagation algorithm. And I will go a little bit into this because it will show you what kind of um, say mathematical operations are required in order to calculate but also to train such a neural network. And that then leads to um, say 
a vision on what kind of hardware do we have to establish in order to perform these calculations. And then we ask ourselves, how can we done do this in the electrical and in the optical domain? So um, let's have a look at this network. Um, so if we have the network, we have the input signal, which is a vector um, x on the left-hand side. Then we do the calculation. So in the end, what's happening is that at every neuron, at every blue dot, we have all these signals coming in from all these inputs. They're all weighted and accumulated, all added together. Um, in the end, that is a vector matrix multiplication. That's what you see there indicated as W. Then in the, um, in the blue dots, in the neurons, we have the nonlinear function, for example, as you see there at the, uh, at the bottom. Um, and then we go to the next layer. That's why it's called a deep neural network, because you have multiple layers. Um, again, a vector matrix multiplication, nonlinear function, and so on until we are at the output. Um, so what you see is that we have a lot of vector matrix multiplications. <clears throat> And depending on the size of the network, of course, um, say the number of neurons that we have in a layer, um, that determines in the end the size of the vector matrix multiplication. Now, let's have a look on the, um, on the formulas on the right-hand side. Suppose we did not yet train the network. Um, and we want to identify the cat that we saw on the previous slide. We come in with the picture on the left-hand side. We go through the whole system. And what we get at the output is, of course, not the right answer. Uh, because the system is not optimized yet. So we have an error. Um, and so we can determine the error on the difference from the actual output with, from what we ha want to have. And then um, the backpropagation algorithm, what you do there is that you take this error and you propagate it from right to left back through the system. That is why it's called backpropagation. So um, in the end, what we want to determine is how do we need to change all the individual weights at every individual layer um, in such a way that the error is reduced? So this will be a kind of iterative process that we will go through. So to do this, you take the derivative of the nonlinear function. Then we need to identify what is the impact of the strength of all these individual um, connections. And for this, we need to do, again, a vector matrix multiplication, but now on the transpose of the matrix. Um, uh, and this way we go through the network. And then this, using this algorithm, in the end we can calculate the change of the weight that you see there, double, delta W, which is then proportional as the inner product of the input signal at every layer times the, um, the, the delta function, so the error at every individual layer. And that's exactly what we had been calculating. Um, and then we can do this, um, this update um, in, um, of the weights, um, the delta W, um, again, as, um, uh, say, to apply this on the, um, on the weights in the network. Now, the message here is we need to do a lot of vector matrix multiplications, either on the matrix itself or on the transpose. Now, um, today, um, using uh, today's computing systems, um, if you want to do these vector matrix multiplications, um, the way how they scale is that they scale with um, the uh, uh, number of neurons n to the power 2. So if the network becomes larger, if the number of neurons increases, uh, the compute effort that we in need um, increases quadratically. And there's a lot of vector matrix multiplications that need to be done. Um, and in a, say, von Neumann computing system where we have memory and we have processing, um, say a lot of these vector matrix um, multiplications are done in a, a graphical processing unit, so a GPU. Um, there's a lot of communication required between memory and the GPU. So it's a um, serial process where you need to do all these calculations um, and you have a very low computing to I.O. ratio. So you really run into this memory bottleneck. Um, so looking at this, how could we try to improve um, say the performance, but also the efficiency of neuromorphic computing. Um, and important here is also to note that in the end, really the, um, the largest part of the compute effort is in doing these vector matrix multiplications. This is the major effort, uh, much less the nonlinear function. So where we want to go to is fully parallel processing. Um, make sure also that we overcome this um, bottleneck in um, um, say, communication between processing and memory. 
Um, and this is, this is already important. If you look at, for example, the power required to do just a simple operation in a processing unit, let's say in the picojoule range, whereas if you need to um, get data out of memory, you quickly go to nanojoules. So um, the amount of power that in the end is um, required to do this operation is to a large part really determined by this um, 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 communication between memory and the processing. Um, and the, on the other hand, uh, what you see there at the bottom is analog signal processing. Today's systems are all digital. So suppose you have a 64-bit system. Um, then the good thing is, of course, that you exactly know what you will have. But the bad thing is that in doing this calculation, there's a lot of overhead in doing the um, calculation on every individual bit uh, and then putting back together again the, the total number. So by going to analog signal processing and really using the physics to do the calculation, we lose in, um, in accuracy, but we clearly can win in efficiency. Um, so that's something um, we are addressing using crossbar arrays, both in the electrical and in the optical domain. So what is a crossbar array? And let's just think about this in the electrical domain. So what we need to do in... Um, this vector matrix multiplication, say at every neuron, we need to do a, a, a multiply function, um, multi multiply the input uh, signal with the weight of this connection. So it's a multiplication. We do this for all these connections, and then we need to, um, say, accumulate this signal, so add them all up, up together. So in the electrical domain, if we apply a voltage across a resistor, then the current that we get is directly uh, the voltage times one over the resistor, resistance, voltage times conductance. So that's directly a multiplication. If you then imagine that you have a lot of resistors where you apply the voltages, and if you then bring back the currents, um, combine the currents, you immediately um, um, say add up all the individual currents, uh, which is the accumulate function. So you, by using Ohm's law and Kirchhoff's law, you have immediately a multiply accumulate. And the way how you can implement this is what you see there on the, um, um, on the larger picture, where we have, for example, in the back end of line of a CMOS process, um, in two planes, we have these um, electrical blue lines, just uh, electrical lines. They are interconnected um, through these um, orange dots um, that are the resistors. Um, this way, by applying the input voltage on the left-hand side and, for example, put the bottom lines on ground, we have the, uh, the voltages across the resistors, we get the current and we accumulate the currents in the line going to the, going to the bottom. Um, these kind of devices can be very small in a, say, modern CMOS process, say a few hundred nanometer. So in the end, you can build very big arrays um, on just a very small area, doing in one step the whole vector matrix multiplication. So this is really a parallel process. Um, and the weights are now, in this case, um, they are written in the values of the resistances in this structure. So you apply the voltage and you the voltage um, on all these channels, and then immediately you have the output. So it's a parallel operation, and you don't need to get the data for the weights and so on because it's already in the system. And if you look on the right-hand side, um, this way we can do the forward operation for calculating the, um, the neural network um, in inference, so just in standard operation. But in the back propagation, if we now, instead of coming in from the left and reading out at the bottom, if we come in from the top and read out on the right-hand side, we do immediately the operation on the transpose of the matrix. Um, so without calculating the transpose, we already have the transpose here baked into this actual structure. And then uh, for the same, for doing the inner product, um, we can also do a calculation um, for the using the delta, so the difference at every individual layer and the input in order to do an update, to do an update of the weights. Um, so in principle, this system can operate very efficient tremendous performance, um, and also very um, in a very power-efficient manner. Um, that's what you see here on the picture on the left-hand side, where, as a function of time, uh, you see currently in terms of, say, the, what is it, um, gigaflops per watt, 
the um, operation of today's systems using, for example, the GPUs, and where we believe we are able to go to, um, first of all, using digital AI cores, but then going to analog AI cores uh, using different types of materials. We believe that we are able to get an improvement of the performance and the efficiency of roughly a factor of 100. Um, however, there is a big challenge, and um, let's just have a look at this again. Um, if we want to do the, um, the calculation of the neural network um, using the weights as they are implemented in the neural network, it's clear in such a situation that all these resistances will need to be able to have all the required values, all the weight values, corresponding to the neural network. So all these resistances have to be set to individual values. And these values have to be, for optimum operation, between 1 and 100 mega ohm. Um, for inference, just for calculation, we need to be able to address up to 100 levels. And if we do um, the training of the neural network, we need to be able to address up to 1,000 levels. So in the end, what we need is the ability to set the resistance uh, to a certain value, and then it must stay there for inference. And if you do the training, um, you ha have to be able to tune the resistance while you do the training of the network to a certain value, both going to higher resistance and also going to lower resistance, because at some point the iteration, the operation may um, determine that it's better to go to a lower resistance again. And there it's very important that this is goes in a nice manner. So that's what I mean there with symmetric. Uh, nicely tune up and tune down of the resistance. And this is really a big challenge. So um, just um, a few words on the challenges in this respect um, and also, say, ways where we can go to for, um, say, building this in the electrical domain. And then I will talk about the solution to do this in the optical domain, and then we can discuss um, the differences and the advantages and disadvantages of every individual um, um, say concept. So there are already various technologies available for doing this kind of electrical crossbar arrays, for example, phase change memory. Um, however, for training, phase change memory has the issue, um, say, without going into detail, but you can, in a phase change material, where you change the material from an amorphous to a crystalline state, and that's where you change the conductance, um, you can nicely crystallize the material, but you cannot sequentially, say, make it amorphous again. You have to make the whole thing amorphous again. So um, it nicely goes symmetric in one direction. Uh, sorry, it goes nicely gradual in one direction, but not in the other. Um, with standard resistive RAM technology, it's exactly the same. What we want is something, as you see on the right-hand side, where we give in, for example, positive pulses. It nicely tunes up. Then we give in negative voltage pulses. It nicely tunes down. So we have this memristor, as you see here, for example, at the bottom as a metal insulator metal device. Um, and then we want to be able to tune, to tune the, um, the resistance. Now, in, in a resistive RAM device, um, I want to explain you how, how that can be done. Um, and that's technology that is well, now, well known. So, for example, we take here um, such a device, metal insulator metal. Um, and on the right-hand side, you see um, the voltage current plot, um, how this behaves. In the beginning, when you just made this device and you apply a voltage, you have a very high resistance. Now, if you then increase the voltage, um, at some point you can form in certain um, metal oxides, like, for example, hafnium oxide, you can form a filament. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a line of oxygen vacancies in this oxide. Um, and at some point, these vacancies start to occur, and you turn from a very high resistance to a very low resistance. And that's, in the end, there, um, the green line. Um, so you come into a low resistance state. You have this filament. Now, if you go to a negative voltage again, you can open this filament again. And by opening this filament, you come back to a high resistance state. And then you can cycle this. That's what you see there. Um, in, the, um, in both the blue and the red lines. Um, and this is something that works in a say, reasonable manner, um, reproducible, and you have two very clearly defined states, a high resistive state and a low resistive state. Um, now, one of the things we are working on at the moment is to try to get this kind of device 
to operate in a more gradual manner, that, that it not just has two, um, two defined states, uh, high and low resistance, but also intermediate states. So how could we do this? Um, one of the things we want to do, uh, okay, let me first just explain you how the, uh, how the whole uh, structure looks. We have titanium nitride as the electrodes, we have the hafnium oxide as the material where we form the filament, and then we have titanium, which is a material that's able to also, say, um, absorb the oxygen vacancies. Now, one of the things we are doing is look into um, different materials for the titanium in order to be able to more gradually take the oxygen vacancies and also give them back to the hafnium oxide. Um, and uh, that's what you see here. So, for example, by going to tungsten oxide as a material instead of titanium, tungsten oxide is a material that if, if you fully oxidize it to tungsten O3, um, it has um, a very high resistance, but you can also get tungsten oxide with, um, that is not fully stoichiometric, um, lower amount of oxygen, for example, tungsten um, O2.5, and then it is conductive. And there are intermediate states. You can uh, oxidize and reduce the material um, so what would happen, for example, uh, that's the question we had, what would happen if we replaced the titanium by the tungsten oxide? And can we get to a more gradual switching of these devices? And that's what you see here. On the left-hand side, you see the standard type of titanium. We built these devices, and you see that they switch um, very abruptly. Um, that's what you see there in the jumps, left and right in the plot. Whereas if we go to the tungsten oxide device, it's not, um, say the change is not so abrupt. Um, there is a high and a low resistive state, but the way how we address it is not with a jump, but it's really much more gradual. Um, so, okay, that's a nice indication. Um, then what we did is that we just changed. Um, let's look at the second plot there. We changed, we, we, we changed the voltage across the device um, from, um, say, positive to negative voltage, but we also change the amplitude. And while changing the amplitude, you see uh, on the right-hand side that we change the value of the high resistive state and the low resistive state, um, depending on the voltage that we apply. And it's also reversible. If we go to lower voltages again, um, then also the higher res low resistive states come back. Um, of course, this happens only if we have, uh, say, the voltages a little bit higher, say, above 1.7 volt. If you read out at 0.2 volt, the important thing is that nothing will happen, that it stays where it is. Um, and that's what you see here. So if we address different states and we read out at 0.2 volt, then as a function of time, really these individual states remain where they are. Now, this is a great start. However, if you have a neural network, and when you train the neural network with the backpropagation algorithm, what you do is that you apply positive voltage pulses or negative voltage pulses, depending on whether you want to increase or decrease the, uh, the resistance. Um, and that's what we tried. Um, and that's what you see here. We apply, say, 400 pulses positive. Um, and then when we are, say, in the right regime and with the right amplitude, you see that we can nicely change the resistance um, going up. And then when we come to it negative voltage pulses, it goes down again. And looking at the, the blue curve, um, you see that it's pretty symmetric and nicely reproducible going up and down. And what we believe what's happening here is that um, in the tungsten oxide, we are, um, say, also able to modify the, um, um, the width on, of, of, say, the diameter of this conductive filament. Um, and when we compare, say, this with the original titanium-based hafnium oxide device, the original technology, where we did not yet apply the, um, the tungsten oxide, then, um, say, this kind of symmetric behavior that we really want to have, um, we are not able to get there. So, um, as a next step, what we are currently also doing is implement this on CMOS, because that's, of course, very important that we are able to implement these kind of technologies on CMOS. Um, and then the idea is that in the back end of line, we have these analog signal processing for the synaptic function, which means, say, for doing the interconnections, whereas in the CMOS itself, we have the nonlinear function um, and then concatenate these together. So that's what I wanted to say about the electrical structure. Um, and really here, the cool thing is that we are able to get small devices 
just this vector matrix multiplier, for example, we can do a 2,000 by 2,000 matrix um, <clears throat> in an area, say, of a few square millimeter. Total power um, to operate such a device is, say, a few watts. We intend to operate them, say, in up to 50, maybe 100 megahertz um, repetition rate. Um, so looking at the amount of calculations that you get, it's really a tremendous uh, performance in operations per second and also a tremendous um, power efficiency. Um, however, the challenge really is to get this material in place and um, that's able to do this. And if you, if you carefully look at this, um, I mean, the, currently the operation is reasonable. However, the resistance values that we have are still far too low. We need to increase this with a factor of at least 10 to 100 uh, from kilo ohm to mega ohm. Okay, um, I wanted to show you this, um, although this is a photonics conference, um, also to be able to offset this to an optical way to do it. Um, and that's what you see there on the right hand side. So um, I already discussed the electrical crossbar, but we can also do an, an, a crossbar in the optical domain. Um, and what we are working on there is using so to say holography, um, where in a photorefractive material, and I will explain you in the next slide what that is, but we are able to write multiple gradings, so corrugations on top of each other in a photorefractive material, um, and that way um, do the operations exactly um, equivalent to what we have in the electrical domain. So the way how we discriminate the individual signals in the optical domain um, is by having plane waves that come in under different angles um, instead of, say, individual signaling lines as we have them in the electrical case. Um, then these signals are diffracted on the gratings that we have written into the material um, into different directions. Um, that is what you see there, the vector matrix operation, the diffraction efficiency is the multiplication, whereas the adding all the signals that come out in one direction um, is the uh, accumulation. And again, we can do both update, um, inference, and back propagation on the transpose. So how does this work um, using the photoreffective effect? Um, just have a look there at the center, uh, center picture. Suppose we have two coherent beams that um, counter propagate, then we have um, a standing wave. And in a photorefractive material, we have carriers that are trapped and that can be excited by, um, um, by the photons. So, there where we have um, a high local intensity, these carriers get excited, they uh, diffuse, and they get trapped in the regions close by that are dark. Um, and this way, we get a charge separation. That's what you see there on the second line. Um, because of this charge separation, you have a local electrical field. And um, in a photorefractive effect, you also have a Pockels coefficient. So um, the refractive index changes with the value of the electrical field. So in the end, um, this charge separation gives rise to a, a, a local variation of the refractive index. Uh, and if you take away um, the input beams, um, because the, the, the carriers are trapped, um, your refractive index change remains, and now you can do these operations, um, as I explained before, on this material. And maybe just to show that also, I mean, it's a very important difference there that compared to the electrical and the optical case, in the optical case, we just write all these gradings on top of each other. Um, whereas in the electrical case, you have a lot of individual devices. Uh, the way how we can discriminate the, um, say, the individual weights is just based on, um, say, the individual gradings that we write in here, um, and then um, the interference properties that give rise to exactly just constructive interference in the direction where you, where you want it to be, just as in the hologram. So just let, let's quickly look at this. Um, suppose we write a first grading, which what you see on the left-hand side. Um, then we come in with a second source, again, with the reference beam, um, so that's uh, in the middle. So we have now just written, written two gradings into the material um, on a slightly different angle. Um, then when we take the reference beam away, 
we can now uh, do the calculations um, by doing coming in with the individual uh, beams, S1 and S2. Um, they come in at different angles, but because the way they are written, the output goes to the top in the same direction. Um, we have the multiply based on the refraction efficiency, and we have to accumulate because both beams um, come to the same direction out, uh, go to the same uh, detector in the end. Now, why is this of interest? Um, and say, doing this in the optical domain is clearly larger in the end than doing it in the electrical domain because, I mean, 200 nanometer, what do you do in optics with 200 nanometer? Not a lot. Um, the wavelength we use here is 1.3 micrometer. The material we use is gallium arsenide. Um, the cool thing here is, although, I will talk about that later, although the device size will be larger, but the cool thing is that one photon generates one electron. So it's a purely linear effect. Um, and just imagine that we have written this grading as you see it here. And now we want to decrease the strength of this grading again. The only thing we need to do is apply um, a pi phase shift in one of the interfering beams. And just the, um, where we used to have a maximum, now we will have a minimum. So by doing this, we start to re excite the electrons that were trapped in the dark regions. And again, it's a linear process. One photon generates one electron. Um, and we can also nicely, symmetrically reduce the strength of the grating. It's in the end a matter of, say, the amount of energy that we apply. Um, so inherently, this effect has the properties that we want to have for doing the training of the neural network. That's the cool thing. Um, and that's why we are very in interested and excited in, in pursuing this. However, um, it's not new. People did this already in the 90s uh, using bulk setups. Um, however, at that time, um, this did not move forward because in, because in the end it's a coherent system, it's interference. Um, the size you can do it and the stability you can do it with is, uh, is just limiting. Um, but today what we have is silicon photonics. And so our intent here is to build this whole structure in silicon photonics technology um, by co-integrating onto silicon photonics a thin layer of gallium arsenide as the photorefractive material. Um, so what we need to do um, is, say, make sure that we create um, the incoming plane waves. Um, we can do that by having individual point sources. Um, that's what you see, for example, here the, the um, in orange, we have individual point sources. Um, when we then go into a, a region where we have plain silicon, just as a planar waveguide, the beam will diverge. Then we have a collimating mirror, and then we focus this into the region where we have the photoreffective material. And because we have all these individual point sources at a slightly different position, they will enter into, under different angles into the photoreffective material. Um, Important is that we, of course, have to set the amplitudes of all the individual point sources. This is what we can use silicon photonics for, using just, say, reasonable speed, but good efficiency modulators. Um, that's what you see there indicated as transmission array. We have two of those, of course, in the end, in order to be able to create the interference. And on the receive side, we put um, an array of detectors, just standard silicon germanium detectors, in order to, to, um, to go back to the electrical domain. So although this is an optical processing unit, um, the input and the output signals are electrical, which is important because we want to be able to integrate the whole thing into a standard electrical system. Um, and we did several, uh, several experiments on this. First of all, in a bulk setup, that's what you see here um, at the bottom. Um, what, you, what we do here is that we build a Max Indre interferometer. Um, in, say, the second beam splitter, we have the gallium arsenide photorefractive material. Um, and then with the phase modulator, we can either, say, um, say, we can change the phase of the incoming beam by pi, and this way, say, build up a certain grating and reduce the grating again. That's what you see there. And you see that it's very reproducible. Um, then what you see here is the... Um, the whole collimating unit, um, and 
There we want to be able to identify that if we come in from a point source, we come out at a point source at the other side again to be able to detect nicely at the detector what we have. This is just purely passive, no photorefractive, but we have low loss and, and a good, say, a roughly 20 dB um, suppression ratio for the unwanted channels. The transmission array, uh, in this case for uh, 1 to 8, uh, just using standard silicon photonics, in this case uh, thermal optic devices in order, Maxenders, in order to do the splitting. Um, and then the integration of gallium arsenide on silicon, um, where we use, say, we realize the gallium arsenide, we bond it to silicon um, using oxide bonding, and then we couple the light using just a, a kind of vertical directional coupler uh, to go from the silicon to the gallium arsenide. Um, so if we look at this, in, we've estimated how, how large a kind of device would we be able to make in the optical domain. And our conclusion is we can do a 2,000 by 2,000 in roughly 2.5 by 2.5 centimeter chip. Um, if you remember, say, the electrical device, 2,000 by 2,000 in, say, a few millimeter by a few millimeter. So roughly the size of this chip is a factor of 50 larger. Um, this has, of course, some severe consequences. Um, it means that on one chip we cannot build a lot of these devices, and in the end what we do here is just the synaptic function, the interconnection between two layers in the neural network. We need multiple of those to build a full neural network. In the electrical domain we can build them all on one chip. In the optical case we would have to integrate such a device on the printed circuit board uh, and then multiple of those so it's, it's more a board level assembly instead of say a chip level integration that we are able to do. Um, the amount of power for the optical case, again, just a few watts, um, even for a few thousand by a few thousand is our estimate. So in terms of performance, we believe the optical can certainly be um, very competitive with the electrical one in terms of size. Uh, we have a challenge. So uh, the good thing is that we know in the optical domain exactly how the device is operating. It's symmetric, it's reproducible. Um, and the question then is how, uh, how much an effect, how much an impact does this have on the overall functionality of, for example, training a neural network. So one way to look at it is maybe, it's the, opti maybe the optical case is good for doing very efficient training of neural networks in a cloud system. Whereas the electrical case is good because it's small for kind of edge applications. Um, very important just to notice, what I talked about is that base of, um, say, the, the technology and the hardware in order to build um, efficient accelerators for neural networks. Of course, what's also required is the optimization of the whole architecture and especially also the algorithms in order to be able to handle this kind of analog signal processing devices because we have to do with lower accuracy, uh, challenges with drift and noise that you don't have in the electrical case uh, that all needs to be handled and be taken into account and there's others in IBM that are looking at that. Um, so with that, um, I would like to conclude um, with say just indicating silicon technology will remain of importance. Neuromorphic computing is an important new direction and there is several ways to, win, to, um, to implement efficient and power um, and high performance uh, accelerators um, for next generation neural networks. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Bert. Very, very interesting. The, the change from the electrical to, to the photonic, we were all waiting for the change. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, really interesting, the, the, the final conclusions that you extract uh, with the best uh, opportunities for each technology. Very, very interesting. Now, some questions. Is there any question for, for Bert? <laughs> okay. Please present yourself. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Martin Reicher from uh, Synopsys. Um, you're saying that um, one of the issues that you have 
is the num number of uh, interconnects that you need to make between all the neurons, uh, between all the nodes in your um, intermediate layers. But if I, I, I don't really have a, a background in, 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 in like biology or anything like that, but as far as I know, in, in, in uh, biological neurons, there are not every neuron is connected to every other neuron in a neural network. So might that be some way of um, reducing the complexity and improving the performance and size of your uh, neural networks by just interconnecting one neuron with maybe four or eight in the next level? Um, yeah, absolutely. So if you, if you look at neural networks and the architecture of, say, modern neural networks, often what you have in the beginning is, uh, say, smaller sections, especially in convolutional neural networks, but then at the end you have um, some larger um, arrays, larger number of neurons that are interconnected as well. And indeed, to some extent, also sparse connectivity occurs, um, but that's also why we are doing say the whole optimization um, of this technology in conjunction with people who do this uh, optimization of the architectures and the calculation of the architectures in order to see what is the best way to implement this technology um, for um, say getting the best efficiency and, and performance in the end. Um, and indeed, uh, this, this kind of technology is in the end able to do full connectivity and we don't need that in all cases. That's absolutely right. But what we see for the applications we are looking into, um, real-world applications, is that with this kind of technology, we do gain roughly a factor of 100 in power efficiency compared to, for example, GPUs. Thank you very much. OK. Any other question? More questions for Bert Offren? Yeah, Christian Gill was on KDH in Stockholm. Uh, I, probably you said it, but I didn't really get catch it. Uh, the optical network is that like persistent? It keeps its state when you switch it off, or um, I did say a bit about it, but not too much. So um, it does, but not indefinitely over time. So um, with the gallium arsenide we are using at the moment. Um, the time it remains is roughly a second, maybe a little bit less. Um, so, um, using the photoreflective effect, we are not able to really write the grating and that's it. Um, but if you think about, uh, say, just roughly a second, um, and then we would need to refresh the whole, um, the whole photoreflective um, effect in the, um, um, in, the, in, the, in the device, um, the operation is, say, just for inference, it's probably what we anticipate, 50 to 100 megahertz. Um, so, and maybe a training cycle, uh, we can do that with, say, a repetition rate of 10 megahertz. So, looking at it that way, you see that we can do a tremendous amount of operations before we have to refresh the weights in the system. Um, so, it's not indefinite but we believe it's long enough for the training of the neural network to make it efficient. Thanks. Next question, uh, Guillermo. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you very much for the talk. I was uh, wondering, because when you show the diagram of the neural network, you show several layers. And uh, what you show is uh, would uh, be useful for uh, implementing one layer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is, is that limiting the uh, computing that you can do, or you can go around with just one layer? No, no, uh, so in the end, in an actual system, you need multiple of these devices that you concatenate. So you have one device um, for one layer. Um, from a device, you go into the nonlinear function, you go back into the next one, and so on and so on. So, um, and that's also why what I said, for example, of the comparison between electrical and optical is important because in the electrical case, we are able to implement multiple of these accelerators on the same chip. And in the optical case, that is not possible. So in the end, to build a full network, um, in the electrical case, we can still do that on a, on a silicon chip, 
Whereas in the optical case, we have to do it on a big board where we position multiple of these chips on the board. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. Thank you. More questions? No? How many of these devices would you need in the optical case and how, how much space would it be needed for some, for example, application that you have in, in your mind now? So I, I cannot give you a definite answer yet because uh, it really depends on the, on the problem that you want to implement. Um, and um, as I s said before, often what you see is that in, in the neural network in the beginning you have um, some um, smaller size operations, um, for example in the convol convolutional neural network, whereas in the end you have a larger uh, vector matrix operation. So maybe it would make sense at some point to just do a few of these devices at the end, whereas in the beginning we use other technology because clearly this efficiency improvement that we get becomes larger if we go to larger devices. So maybe it, it's the best to use this in, at the end of the neural network where you have the multiple connections and use a different technology at the beginning, could be. Right. Any other question? No? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bert.